It's called a cyclorotor, a rotating wing that doesn't behave like anything else in the sky. Not a helicopter blade, not a jet engine, something different, strange, circular. For over a hundred years, inventors have tried to make it fly. Most couldn't. Some pretended they did. One succeeded, but only in water. Ships turned, tugs danced, and still the sky remained out of reach. Until now, because after decades of silence, the circle is spinning again. In labs, in hangars, in the dreams of engineers chasing control, precision, and quiet flight. What once looked like a mistake, now looks like the future. The first rotors that never flew. It started with a circle and a question. Could a machine fly not with wings, but with something stranger? In 1909, Russian military engineer E.P. Sverchkov thought it might. He built the Samolyot, a curious contraption with paddle wheel-like arms designed to generate lift through rotation. It never left the ground, but it marked the first known attempt at what we now call a cyclorotor, a machine that didn't flap or spin like a propeller, but rotated its wings around a central point, almost like flight, was reimagined. Decades later, in the 1930s, German engineer Adolf Rohrbach revived the idea. Backed by the German Research Institute for Aviation, DVL, Rohrbach's cyclorotor design caught brief attention. But when international aviation journals questioned its feasibility, funding dried up. Interest faded. Once again, the rotors stopped before they truly began. Then came Jonathan Edward Caldwell, an American with more confidence than credibility. He proposed a strange aircraft with rotating wings that would mimic the motion of birds. It never flew. Caldwell was later arrested for fraud. The machine disappeared, and so did he. Another attempt surfaced in 1930 with the Schroeder S1. It was a full-size prototype that used a cyclorotor for forward thrust only. The design looked more like a flying harvester than a plane. It never achieved flight either. These early attempts were messy, strange, and ultimately unsuccessful. But they carried something powerful, the refusal to let go of an idea. In each failure, the vision stayed alive. Flight, not as we know it, but as it could be. Something circular, something different, something is still waiting. The Voith Schneider propeller, spinning into success. While the skies were quiet, the water listened. In 1931, Ernst Schneider patented something that looked eerily similar to those failed aerial machines, a set of vertical blades rotating in a circle. But this time, it wasn't meant for flight. It was for ships. Working with the Voith company, Schneider created what became known as the Voith Schneider Propeller, or VSP. Unlike traditional marine propellers, the VSP didn't push water straight backward. Instead, it spun multiple blades around a vertical axis, adjusting their angles in real time. The result was extraordinary. A vessel could move sideways, turn on the spot, or glide forward with quiet precision. No rudder needed, no turning arc, just direct, immediate movement. The first successful test came in 1937, and it changed maritime control forever. Tugboats could now navigate tight ports with ease. Ferries could dock with exactness. It was a revolution beneath the surface. During World War II, militaries took notice. A few specialized vessels were fitted with the new system, but widespread adoption was slow. The war wanted familiar machines, not fragile new ideas. After the war, the VSP found its home in civilian life. Ports, harbors, and offshore industries embraced it. Over the decades, Voith improved the design, refining materials and systems until it became a standard in dynamic marine propulsion. While the world forgot about spinning wings in the air, in the water, the circle had finally found its purpose, 
and it was thriving. War, innovation, and the post-war boom. In war, there is little room for patience. Ideas need to work fast, or not at all. The Voith Schneider propeller was a marvel, but it was also new, and new things are rarely trusted in battle. A few vessels used it during World War II, nimble, maneuverable crafts, where precision was more valuable than speed. But it didn't spread far. After the war, everything changed. Ports were growing. Offshore platforms were multiplying. The world's harbors were crowded with ships that needed to turn tightly, move sideways, and react instantly to wind, current, or human error. The VSP answered that call. Tugboats, ferries, fireboats, and any vessel that needed sharp, smooth control began to rely on the spinning circle of the VSP. As technology improved, so did the propeller. Stronger metals, faster control systems, better hydrodynamics. And yet, for all its success in water, no one had figured out how to make it fly. The challenge was more than technical, it was elemental. Air behaves differently, it's less dense, less forgiving. What worked so beautifully in one world couldn't simply be lifted into the next. Not without starting over. Not without dreaming again. Now first, like always, be sure to hit the like button down below. It helps us out tremendously with the reach of this video. Thank you. From water to air, cyclorotors take flight. The idea never truly vanished. It just waited, quietly spinning below the surface until someone dared to bring it back into the air. That someone was a team of engineers at Cyclotech, an Austrian company with a single obsession, making cyclorotors fly. Where others saw outdated failures, they saw untapped potential. For over 15 years, they worked to rewrite the rules of propulsion, not by mimicking helicopters or drones, but by returning to that strange circular motion the same that had once quietly reshaped how ships moved. Why now? Because the world is changing. Cities are growing taller, tighter, louder. And the dream of quiet, precise vertical flight is no longer science fiction. It's a need. One that cyclorotors might uniquely fulfill. In recent tests, Cyclotech demonstrated a kind of movement that seemed impossible. A craft that could hover in place, shift sideways, or rotate without banking or tilting. This was controlled at a new level, not just up and down, but anywhere, instantly. That level of maneuverability is priceless in urban air mobility, where every inch matters and silence is golden. It's no longer just about flying. It's about how we move through space itself. And a machine once forgotten beneath the waves is now rising toward the clouds, reborn as something the world might finally be ready for. How a cyclorotor works. To understand why this is so different, you have to look closely. A cyclorotor isn't like a propeller spinning on a single axis. It's more like a wheel, blades arranged around a central hub each one constantly changing its orientation as the wheel turns. These blades, or aerofoils, don't just spin passively. They rotate actively, adjusting their angle of attack depending on where they are in the loop. That angle of attack, the tilt of each blade, is what determines how much lift or thrust it produces. For example, to move upward, the blades at the top of the wheel tilt so they push air downward. The blades on the bottom tilt the opposite way. And as the wheel spins, each blade shifts its orientation in a synchronized dance, always adjusting, always reacting. This is done through complex mechanical linkages in some systems, ensuring that each blade changes position at the right time. More advanced versions like ABB's Dynafin or Cyclotex rotors use individual servo motors for each blade. This gives even more control and more responsibility. Each movement has to be perfect. Because of this constant repositioning, 
Cyclorotors can change the direction of thrust almost instantly. Up, down, sideways, forward or back. It's just a matter of changing the blade angles. That level of control is nearly impossible with traditional propellers or rotors. And here's something else. All the blades move at the same speed. There are no fast spinning tips to create noise or drag. That makes them quieter, smoother, and more predictable. In cities, in confined spaces, that matters. A lot. The hidden benefits and the harsh trade-offs. Cyclorotors promise a lot. Precision, silence, control. They could make flights smoother, safer, and quieter, especially in crowded places. For air taxis or emergency response vehicles weaving through city skylines, that kind of agility could change everything. And then there's the noise or lack of it. Traditional propellers generate loud vortices, especially at their tips where the blades move fastest. Cyclorotors don't have that problem. Because all their blades move at the same speed, the noise they create is more even and often much quieter. For urban flight, that could be the difference between acceptance and rejection. But it's not a perfect system. That same intricate control that allows for fine movement also makes things more complicated. Mechanical linkages are difficult to maintain. Servo motors are fragile under stress. Every blade is working constantly, changing angles, taking on different forces as it moves. Over time, that strain adds up. There's also the issue of weight. Cyclorotors aren't light. Their size and moving parts demand strong materials and powerful motors. That can cancel out the efficiency gains, especially in small aircraft, where every kilogram counts. And as the rotors spin faster, another force fights back, centrifugal force. It tries to tear the rotor apart from the inside out. Engineers have to battle that with materials, structure, and sheer will. It's a clever idea, but clever alone won't keep it in the sky. Only balance will. And balance is never easy. The cyclorotor is more than a machine. It's a reminder of how some ideas vanish only to return when the world is ready. What began as a failed attempt to fly found its first breath underwater. Now it rises again, not loudly, but deliberately, spinning toward a future that values silence, precision, and control. Maybe it won't replace helicopters. Maybe it won't change cities overnight. But something about it keeps engineers dreaming keeps investors watching, keeps that circle turning. In the end, not all revolutions roar. Some just hum, softly, persistently, waiting for the moment they're finally heard. The sky, after all, is patient. 